I want to like walk into the food court at my local mall and just like do that monologue with as much gusto as possible. Do you think uh, I'd get arrested or anything? These days, no. Oh yeah, okay, good. Yeah, you just oh. go on whatever TikTok or whatever the children are using these days, and you'd be broadcast to the entire world, and you'd be viable for like ten seconds, and then people would move on. You know, right. you'd be on uh, Reddit public freakout. Our <laughs> that would be the end of it all right all right i can I, that's something to aspire to possibly it's it's something it's definitely something hey folks it's film trace uh welcome back it's the podcast we trace the life from a film uh from conception to production all the way to release and reception it airs our manhunt series we are in episode five no wait six of the series the 1970s apocalypse now and Logan's run, we have Mike Field from Forgotten Cinema. Say hello, Mike. How you doing? Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm doing well. What's uh, what's the latest with Forgotten Cinema? What have you guys been up to? Uh, so we had taken a break for a year, actually. We came back uh, probably about four or five months ago. So we're into the middle of our season 19, and we're about to kick it. We do every October, we do like a Forgotten Horror. So we're about to... Uh, we did six films this year, uh, five Wednesdays and one for Halloween. So uh, getting into the horror mood, I guess. Yeah. Uh, love it. Absolutely. When's, do you remember, Mike, what the last episode you were on? Uh, I want to say Sorcerer. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sorcerer and Death Trap. Yeah. Yes. Sorcerer. Classic. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I feel like that movie is like on every podcast in like the last five years. Right. Like it's got so yeah. reclaimed all of a sudden. And now I see it on like film Twitter constantly. Oh, yeah. It's, like it's, it's a yeah. shot of Roy Scheider, you know, Scheider doing his thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the bridge with the truck. Oh, my God. Um, well, yeah. Welcome back. Uh, Forgotten Cinema. Great stuff. Uh, you kind of do a, uh, uh, at least when I was listening, I got to catch up on this new season. Um, I mean, some of the films you guys find, like, I, and I'm somebody that remembers, like, the most ridiculous Drek from the 90s. And then you guys are pulling out stuff where I'm like, I, I, did that really exist? Yeah, like, <laughs> have you guys done an April Fool's episode that, <laughs> I don't know. I like, uh, uh, how is it, how do you guys, like, choose and find these kinds of crazy movies? So Mike and I, uh, my partner, my uh, co-host, Mike Butler, we w- worked together at a movie theater uh, for forever. And we would oh. always, always talk, always talk movies and always talk. And, I, and I'm older than him. He's uh, he's in his mid thirties. I'm, I'm approaching 50. And yeah. uh, I've seen, you know, uh, there's I've seen more movies than he has. So I was always like, oh, what about this film? He's like, I never saw that. So we started making a list and we have this giant uh apple uh notes list of just movies and i actually put a lot of the older ones in there because a lot of because i just remember them like clay pigeons is one we did with vince vaughn uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> and he had, and he loved it and i'm like it's really cool when we get to do ones that he doesn't know about and he's like i don't understand why i never saw this film and i'm like exactly like that's what the sh- that's what the show's for yeah yeah uh, striking distance that episode is the one that i yes. was just like i mean like i i feel like it's like one of those Mandela effects where it's like, I think I remember that VHS at, at Blockbuster back in the day, but I, I can't, I can't be like, there really was like a Bruce Willis speedboat movie, like three years after Die Hard. That's nuts. Yeah. And, and like where his like hairline and his, and his pay changes between the <laughs> <Yes>. scenes. <laughs> uh, amazing. Amazing. Um, all right. Well, Dan, you convinced me that Apocalypse Now... <laughs> It counts. It absolutely counts. I, I, I have to admit, after doing a, a rewatch, and I haven't rewatched the movie in over 10 years, it yeah. does. It totally fits the it genre. It totally fits the genre of manhunts, right? It's, but I mean, what made you think of it? What, what made me think of it? Right. Um, I don't know. Like, I was, I always try to, whenever we're doing like a decade, I always want to, like, oh, I want to find like something that's a little bit lesser known. Or like a little bit on the fringes, maybe you're forgotten, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But like for Apocalypse, it's just like I had to pick it because it's like it's one of the like the movies, the films that exist in the canon, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And people don't think about 
uh, the thing that I always think about Apocalypse Now is it has all of these cultural touchstones that are so removed from the context of the film. And it's like, I just think it's one of those movies where you got to go back to it. I want to think about it strictly from this manhunt sort of perspective and just kind of approach it from a different a different angle okay. um, and just kind of see it in a different way. Um, I also think it's one of those movies that people talk about a lot, but don't analyze a lot per se. It's like people throw it around as like, oh, it's the best movie ever. But like, I don't hear people actually engaging with the film and like, right. what is it about? Right. And like the symbols, because it's pretty, it's a pretty screwed up movie. Like it's not, yeah. uh, there's a lot going on here that is uh, good, bad, everywhere in between, crazy. Uh, so yeah, I felt like I, it would be a good conversation piece uh, to sort of, uh, you know, talk about and it's also like the 70s movie or one of them so right I feel like it's the very death of the 70s yeah very representative <laughs> of the decade and sort of the the golden era or one of the golden ages of hollywood new hollywood i should say um it's also one of my favorite movies you know? yeah i saw yeah. it i think for the first time in like college uh in like didn't see it in high school probably was scared to see it in high school i was like what is this this is crazy and then i think i saw it like in the basement of the library at wake forest i was like <laughs> what's going on and like you know just me alone and like the stacks watching this it was a it was definitely an experience to remember um i don't know what about you guys like how do you uh, how do you guys approaching this film is it like an, an old favorite is it something you caught more recently what's your sort of relationship with the film mike go ahead because uh we gave you a couple options and you gravitated towards this one pretty easily it seemed yeah uh, um when I first watched, I watched the to, for this for this rewatch. I watched Redux, by the way. I watched yeah, the long same. one. Uh, okay, I was just like, I have to watch because and I've seen it before. But um, when I first watched it, and I was much younger. You know, it was you know, I love film. I wanted to get into film, and obviously, this is the movie you need to watch. It was one, you know, it's, it's on the list, so I watched it, and I I enjoyed it and I liked it. But like, I was too young to I think really grasp everything in the movie. Espe- you know. So when I watched it the second time, I, I watched it a couple more times after that. But when I watched it, when Redux came out, I think I got a little bit more out of it. And I just it's one of those movies that I always want to revisit and go back to because I think there's, you know, how, how my maturity in life, I think I can pull something different from the movie within each rewatch. And I mean, I, I got a little bit of that here, especially that with under the lens of uh, the theme for to the for the episode today, I was definitely able to like kind of like dig into that and just be like okay this is you know the hunted and the hunter and just try to like focus on that a little bit and kind of really focus on martin sheen and really focus on like the scenes when he meets brando at the end i'm just kind of like yeah. i'm in like engage and this is like late yeah. night and it's like hour three and i'm just like holy crap just like <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it, it was, and I, and like, I think I told you when I chose it, I, I love seventies films. So I just, I, any chance to go back is great. Absolutely. Yeah. I had a similar experience, uh, to you, Dan, I, I was in high school though. And, uh, I had, uh, kind of unfettered access to this in, enormous, uh, video store in, uh, Texas where, when I was visiting my sister, uh, for spring break, I think senior year. And, uh, I, she just basically like gave me, you know, a couple twenties and said, go nuts. And they had so many previously viewed videos for sale of all genres, all decades. And so I like, I, I just like stocked up on the classics that I had been hearing about. Cause I was getting more interested in film. I got citizen Kane. I got Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And then, uh, um, apocalypse now and i was just like this is okay i'm gonna try this vhs out like by myself while my sister's at work the next day and i was just like yeah they, they, i have a visceral memory yeah. of just like the the light peering in through her vertical blinds while there's like so much interesting stuff going on with light and shadow especially at that ending scene where it's the confrontation right yeah. between the hunter and the hunted and uh, yeah it was it was easily just like one of the most uh insane things to see 
especially you know even in comparison to uh, like platoon and full metal jacket which i also watched around the same time and also mm-hmm. very much affected me but this one is just like uh and i i, I, I said this to you uh uh on our friend slack uh dan but like yeah. it's just crazy how it's like 10 years later i watched this again i'm just like this is just a completely other level of filmmaking not yeah. just vietnam filmmaking but just like i i could not I, I'm, I'm excited to, to, to get into it, um, and we will have to save some time for Logan's run, unfortunately. But <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, so this manhunt lens, like, what's the first thing you guys were looking for uh, when following Martin Sheen as this hunter tracking down Colonel Kurtz, especially in comparison to a lot of the films we've been talking about? For reference, Mike, like obviously we've talked about Zodiac and we've talked about um, Seven and Memories of Murder, Born Identity even to go on more like a uh, pop movie tangent. Um, and we started out with like Long Legs and Trap as being like the new movies that made us want to get into digging through the the manhunt genre. And um, I got I got some uh, I got some Josh Hartnett parallels for you guys, but I won't I won't do, I won't do it. I won't do it. Um, well, listen, I listened to that episode, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. It was pure torture. Uh, <laughs> right, like the like the Vietnam War, exactly. Like the Vietnam War. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I feel like, um, you know, from the manhunt perspective, I feel like it it's such a bizarre thing for, like, the army or the military who's sort of, like, so buttoned up and has so many rules. They're like, oh, hey, uh, Captain, you're basically a raging alcoholic and totally unstable. Let's just send you off into the jungle and go after this mad. <laughs> it doesn't like it doesn't kind of add up at all, but no. it's very seventies, and so like everybody's super fucked up, and like everybody's battling these in- intense internal demons, uh, and it's like one screwed up person going to hunting after another really screwed up person. Kind of reminds me a little bit of Man Manhunter, where it's like you got yeah. this mm-hmm. FBI profiler who's definitely unstable and kind of thinks a little bit like a serial killer going after an actual serial killer and i think there's there's definitely a ton of parallels to that here um and it's like i i think that's the, one of the the hallmarks of 70s american filmmaking is there's not really yes there's a protagonist right without a doubt uh, but it, it's not a good guy thing it's not a good guy versus no. bad guy thing it is a morally pitch black sort of world where and i think that's kind of the point right that like there is no moral ground or center which is a huge message of the 70s um and that led to reagan thanks everybody um (laughs) uh, you know i think that and this movie is like the paradigm of that where it it does call into question or at least tries to all of these assumptions that we've made about society about america about politics uh and and yeah and even about like the whole idea of going after the bad guy and trying to find him it it doesn't really play into any of those uh tropes or conventions at all which i think is you know to its credit yeah i mean i think uh you're you're in the like what would you say like what would you think like the 60s where you start kind of getting a lot of your protagonists who have shady backgrounds like murky Mm -hmm. rebellious they're not anti-hero white hat versus black hat yeah like that kind of stuff like so i think you're in that now um, I think the biggest thing I got with 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 Sheen's performance in terms of him just going down the river is him tr- uh, trying to understand who he's going after, trying to understand Kurtz and trying to, I don't know if he's trying to maybe side with him, but in, but I, I wonder if that's in his head or in their notes when they're when they're doing this, when he's doing the performance is like, is there a question? Is Coppola saying to him, you know, listen, there's a chance that you might agree with Kurtz. So I'm um, and that's what you're deciding down this river. So I, I really liked the just him trying to get to know the hunted, and and yeah. and, and you know trying to and and just kind of figure out what he's and he says it obviously I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there. Um, so I kind of really enjoyed that part of the uh, of the story of this rewatch this time. Absolutely, one of the things that stood out to me 
on this rewatch through this lens was just how quickly um, Willard starts empathizing with uh, uh, Kurtz's character, like just as he's going through the dossier for like the second time. Yeah. It's like all he has to do is like hang out with Robert Duvall's character for one day, and then he's like, "Yeah, I can see. We should probably we should probably all die." Like <laughs> it's 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 uh and it still works like even in the Redux version <laughs> like you still have this as a viewer empathy for Willard even though he is having empathy for a madman like cult leader um it's I don't think any movie's ever been able to do that kind of magic trick um since right where it's not just like stock standard anti-hero um it's yeah it's specifically like it's okay to like feel the vibes of a madman <laughs> yeah that's a really good point because i don't know that like um a lot of movies since this era have been able to like recapture just the yeah i guess it's the moral ambiguity of these protagonists because it's like there isn't what is like redeeming about this person Right, not much. Are you? Are you? Uh, now, are you talking about Kurtz or Willard? Willard. Okay, like, yeah. <laughs> like, he's our guide, right? He's like our our you know north star in the movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as he's experiencing these moments of debauchery and casual extreme violence, and we see his expression. Like I, I always love the scene where they get to sort of like the last outpost. And he goes, who's in charge here? And then and the guy goes, well, aren't you? Right? Yes. Or something along those lines. And the look on his face, like that's us, right? That's the audience thinking that like, oh, there's somebody in charge. Yeah. There's some sort of structure or order here. Um, and I don't know, like I, I can't think of, and as I say that, I'm sure there's a great examples that I can't think of, of movies that capture that sense of being along this journey with someone who's not super likable and not a good person, but we're still experiencing almost his naivete yeah. as to how dark the world is, you know, deeper into, I mean, obviously the, the source material is heart of darkness. Um, and I think it plays very different than that book. Yeah. Um, but I think that's, that it's hard to sort of, yeah, it's a really specific feeling of going along the river with him, but not sort of empathizing with him all that much. Willard that is. <laughs> i um i normally don't like voiceover in movies I've Same, sometimes, obviously because yeah. sometimes it's just put in there after the fact because they're trying to cover up something or sometimes it's lazy but i think like this movie you absolutely need it um to just kind of it it, it and especially and i don't know if it's just sheen's voice but it, it just kind of pulls you into the movie when it starts, when he, when the voiceover starts and it just kind of gets you into the journey and you, you just start going along with what you said, just kind of like sidling up with him and just going on this ride and journey with him and you're inside his head. I think that the voiceover is extremely effective uh, to, uh, to help with that in this movie. Absolutely. I mean, I, it, it's totally true that it's usually like a studio note and something forced or mm -hmm. something from an amateur screenwriter. Um, but in in this film like so much of it has to do with like the internal versus the external that it, it just like thematically wouldn't make sense if we were just seeing the external also like martin sheen as amazing of an actor as he is or maybe it's like purposeful for this role and also like i mean he had a heart attack while he was filming the movie yeah. so <laughs> right <laughs> um but he has this kind of like inscrutability to him at least the younger version of himself jed bartlett's in a whole other story but <laughs> he, he very much like has this uh intensity this like quiet intensity about him where you don't know if it's like simmering rage or just like kind of ponderous depression <laughs> and mm -hmm. that so the narration really helps kind of build that out so that you know how close he is to this edge at the you know various checkpoints uh throughout um the the river journey um and, and to, to your point dan about the the heart of darkness context because obviously that's what you know brought uh, Coppola to to want to do a Vietnam uh, movie, and obviously that text is in Africa and it's British colonialists, but uh, it's also what um, led uh, 
Coppola to depart from um, Gordon Willis, who did all, did the first of Godfather uh, as cinematographer, and then uh, picked up Vittorio St- Storaro, which is like this Italian neorealist guy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he uh, like basically like literally took this theme of superimposition of one culture on top of another from the novel and like expressed it through the lens in this movie, as I kind of alluded to er- earlier, everything that's going on with light and shadow. Um, I mean, Marlon Brando added to that too. He, he kind of improvised that scene with like the one patch of light that he kind of goes in and out of um, in his big monologue. Uh, and, and so you know, that's another representation of the internal and the external of the, you know, the, the, um, stereotypical view of the savage in, uh, the jungle versus the, you know, realistic and true, uh, savage that's within the colonialists. So I think that's, that's something that also is like, we haven't really talked about with the manhunt genre is like this idea of (laughs) the oppressed and the oppressor and how that those roles which is very common in war movies but it is not really it doesn't come alive in some of those you know classic detective stories like manhunter um but very much is a part of the genre i think yeah there's like a huge um I mean, Apocalypse Now, I guess, would you call this a political polemic, maybe? <laughs> I mean, it feels like, I mean, it's one of the things that drew me to it. Like, I remember reading Heart of Darkness in high school uh, in, like, British literature, and I was like, this is insane. Like, this is one of the craziest things I've ever read in my life. Um, because it has, like, and I don't know if it's a political polemic, but it's, like, a moral polemic. Um, and I think that, like, Apocalypse Now... You know, yeah, definitely the manhunt is like the plot mechanism Mm -hmm. uh, that keeps things moving forward and you're going down the river closer to this sort of, you know, metaphysical enemy. That reminds me a little bit like Blood Meridian and the Judge. I mean, I'm sure we were inspired. (laughs) We were just talking about that. Yeah, Yeah, we were. Uh, And, um, but I think, and you said you kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit earlier where you're talking about like, oh, like, you know, Platoon's a great Vietnam War movie, but this is something different. And, like, I think while it does obviously fit into this manhunt genre, and it fits into the Vietnam genre and war movie genre, it is doing something so different. And it is um, intention is so different than those films. Like, even, like, a great war film, uh, it just, it's playing by different rules. And I don't know what rules it's playing by, but it's playing by some other sense of logic. Uh, it's almost like a poem rather than like a, a mm-hmm. traditional film. And um, I think that's to me that like really sticks out when watching this again. It's There's so many moments that just feel, I hate to say this word, but I'm going to say it like transcendent. It like <laughs> when you watch these scenes, it's like, I thought you were going to say pure cinema, but it's basically I, I the same thing. I wanted to say yeah. pure cinema. I wanted no to way. say pure cinema, but I could not do it. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it, it I, I, and that's such a good point because there's so many great movies, you know, detectives, this or that, or like, but what, it, what is it about this film to you all that feels so elevated there? I'll say it that word elevated. <laughs> that's another like, loaded one. Yeah. What, I mean, what is it about this that makes it so different uh, or, you know, why does it feel different? Uh, you go first, Mike, because uh, I'm, I want to attack Dan last, if that's yes, okay. Please. That's fine. Why does this feel? You're saying feel different from the other war films, or just in general? Or just, you know, why does it feel like it transcends like? A I mean, hunt yeah, or I don't know. Oh, war film. And I'd be curious, Mike, if you like, because that, that's the part I do agree with Dan is like, are there any other movies operating on this particular wavelength? where it's clearly a cut above nearly everything that's ever been made, regardless of genre, and in this kind of, like, dream state almost. Well, it, it, could, it could be just that you've got such strong performances all, all across the board, and, mm-hmm. like you're, and the storytelling is just top-notch. Like, you've got Coppola at the top of his game. I mean, you've got Robert Duvall in there for, what? 15 minutes maybe and and he's phenomenal and like even to the point when he's like lance i just want my board and it's like he's just just call 
<laughs> I just want everything's forgiven. Um, you know, like he's phenomenal. Brando's phenomenal. She like ev- the whole boat is just like the journey of Lance is is like he goes on. If you just focus on yeah. Lance in this movie, he goes on his own character arc throughout this film, like where he starts from, where he's just the famous surfer to where he ends, where he is clearly like messed up and he is like the it's just the journey or maybe perhaps the war did that to him so there are other there are other small tiny character arcs that are going on here and uh, on top of just just the the i mean i we did not to not to go back to my other podcast my podcast but we did peggy <laughs> sue got married and that's oh, coppola and one yeah. of, and that during that episode i was just like why isn't coppola talked about a lot like scorsese and spielberg mm-hmm. and these these titans that came out of this time frame and, and maybe because he just you know doesn't do as many films but he is such he is a director and a storyteller that's just he knows what he's doing. Um, yeah. I'm not saying his personal life's great, but he does know what he's doing. And, you know, it's just, I think that's, that goes along. That's why apocalypse now is going to probably continue to be talked about, talked about. Um, and it's tough to do a Vietnam war movie and really, uh, in corp- cause the, the, the war itself is, you can't talk about the war without being political. And it's always sure. going to be wrapped within that, 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 uh, that event. So it's really difficult to kind of try to, pull a story out of that where you're not getting bogged down with the, the politics or just, you know, where, it, where it kind of pulls away from that story. It's almost like, this is the story I'm going to get this guy. And it's so focused on that, that you're focused with that and you mm-hmm. can't pull yourself away from it. No matter all the noise that's happening. Because there's scenes where they're having conversations, especially Kilgore and it is loud and there's stuff <laughs> happening all over the place, but you are locked in on what's right. happening in front of you. So I think that's just a, that's just a testament to the storytelling. Yeah, which is a, a, a also just to add on to the the war genre specifically, like there's so many war films that do a great job at making you feel like lost in the chaos and that kind of like scared feeling of being in the middle of something that you know could lead to your death at any moment. But Coppola's kind of take on it with so many of these characters, especially Robert Duvall's is like, no, like you, if you're in this war, like you, all of your instincts are like forward and about survival. And mm-hmm. you're going to have this kind of, you have to lose your mind in order to survive. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of, that plays into, I think a lot of what, also is a part of this manhunt genre which is survival and and this idea of losing your mind going back to you know the manhunter parallels and arguably you know the uh, the long legs par- uh, parallels too uh, uh that's one of the things we both agreed on dan even though we you know split uh opinion of the movie overall mm-hmm. that you know mike monroe kills it as like this detective that's uh also clearly got some kind of you know twisted evil inside of her uh despite her you know total commitment and um uh forward movement on her case uh the uh also thing that stood out to me that i wanted to mention about this kind of idea was uh how uh and maybe this ties into what you were asking dan too about it being a polemic because i think coppola has like one of the most interesting uh like I could read every interview that this guy has ever done and never get tired of it because he, he, he like so many of his movies is like a man of so many different like hypocrisies and, you know, just things that don't quite add up, but it's fascinating and he's poetic when he talks. So, uh, you can, you kind of let it go. Um, he had a interview in the guardian in which he spoke about how he did not view apocalypse now as an anti-war film um he thought that an anti-war film should be quote something filled with love and peace and tranquility uh it shouldn't have sequence of violence that inspire a lust for violence uh apocalypse now has stirring scenes of helicopters attacking innocent people that's not anti-war which i think is both a, a kind of insane thing to say as well as like he he's got a point like he at yeah. least he's not shying away from the fact that he knows he's sensationalizing shit right 
uh, on the one hand, it's like really, really like darkly humorous that those waves aren't shit to surf on. (laughs) But on the other hand, it's like, I, you can't help, especially from that, like just natural masculine testosterone perspective that, you know, we are fascinated by war and watch it on TV and in movies because, it's the closest we can get to like still being safe and experiencing that kind of like rugged terrain and, uh, uh, you know, feel like you're doing something, uh, even though it's just, you know, throwing your life away <laughs> for the military. Yeah, it's a rush. It's yeah. A rush. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's, there's a rush to it. I think that like, yeah, it's funny that he said that because they're watching this film. Uh, there's such a sense of self-awareness that Coppola has when he's making this and of course his editor and everybody involved but like it's not a film where the messaging is like at all muddled but the message itself is very gray and yeah broken, yeah right and I think that to me is such a testament to like there's a, an unbelievable level of confidence here like this ha- may be the most confident film I've ever seen ever made mm. like it is just there's an argument yeah balls to the wall like i mean the all the whole production history of it of course is like uh you know subject of its own obviously documentary but like there's something here that is and it feels very 70s it feels like a sense of freedom and openness to say exactly what someone wants to say with the backing of like hundreds and thousands of people helping to create this artistic vision i think that's the thing about it to me that feels so unique uh, it reminds me, I think that oddly Apocalypse Now reminds me of like a really, really good book. It has that sense of openness and imagination um, and completeness in a way, like a completed message that is like fully tied off at the end. Um, but the message in and of itself is kind of, um, it's not obviously not saccharine, um, but it's not tidy. Right. It, 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 and I hate to say it, but it's like it asks more questions than it answers type thing. Mm-hmm. But it really does have an answer at the end. It's like, yeah, yeah. we're all really violent. And like <laughs> this violence is not just this thing that's off in the jungle or inside of a Huey helicopter when they're blaring Wagner. Right. <laughs> it, it's everywhere. Right. And it's like in everyone. And I think like that's the message that um, is most unsettling. And I think that's one of the reasons why it, it has stuck around for so long and been such a powerful film is it it does have a philo- a very clear philosophical viewpoint um, that is not one that I think is um, politely accepted or accepted in polite culture or something. <laughs> um, you know, it's just not something that people are like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, take anybody like, oh, I'm a father of like four people you know kids and i have this suburban house like i'm not capable of these terrible you are right? I'm Everybody's more capable. capable than most yeah yeah like, <laughs> totally. i mean it's like you are like if you were put in these situations i think it it kind of you know it, and it, again it's also like a very 70s viewpoint this mm-hmm. very pessim- pessimistic viewpoint of humanity in general and the things that we're capable of and uh yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why it has stuck around so long because there's no counter to it right now. There's yeah. not like a counter answer, you know. I think most people see this movie and be like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, most you know everybody's kind of capable of this awfulness, which is not a very pleasant thing to think about, right? No, no. Uh, I did want to mention before we move on to Logan's run. Um, I don't know if you guys felt this way at all, but I just like, couldn't shake it with every scene he was in. Uh, Frederick Forrest as chef. Uh, yeah. I just kept watching him. He's he amazing actor. He's also awesome in the conversation with their Coppola. Um, but in this watch, I was just like, "This is that Tom Hardy?" I felt like <laughs> Tom right. Hardy in every scene. And was, was uh, he trying to do an accent? <laughs> <laughs> except for that, except for that. Oh um, like Ben when he was running from the tiger. Uh, but <laughs> speaking of uh, <laughs> like modern connections, I think as you were talking, Dan, I made the realization that I think the reason that this was like on my list of classic movies um, wasn't just from like the general zeitgeist of uh, film culture in, at the turn of the century, but um, like Max Fisher does Apocalypse Now on stage in Rushmore. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. and at first, I like I think I saw that movie just because I had Bill Murray in it before even like I really understood who Wes Anderson was. But then I was like, oh man, yeah, I think I've heard Serpico and Apocalypse Now are like famous '70s movies. Now I got to go watch them. Um, it's crazy how that. <laughs> there's a textuality yep yep exactly one okay. thing i wanted to ask yeah. one thing i wanted to, before you jump to logan sure. one thing i wanted to ask you or run, yeah what uh, was um the scene where um willard negotiates time with the playboy bunnies <laughs> uh for the for the oil now i know because my question is so th- Obviously, we just talked about how he's an anti-hero, but that's more of in the scope of war, in the scope of just kind of like uh, he's messed up just of what he has done and what he's witnessed. That scene when he negotiates for his guys to have time with them, did that did that just not – not that it didn't sit right, but did it just paint him in a different – did it like in a different light that it, it kind of wasn't following along with the mm-hmm. rest of his kind of murky background? It just felt – it just felt weird. I don't know. It's the only way. It's a, it's a bad way to describe it. But it just felt that's, like weird and odd. And that's in Redux, but not theatrical, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Dan, you, uh, you watched theatrical, I believe. But theatrical, have you, yeah. you you know the scene he's referring to from Redux? Yeah, I vaguely remember it. Okay. Seen a long time ago. Um, well, I also uh, watched Redux, and so I mean, the thing that really stood out to me this time, and I think I, I don't know how many times I've seen which version. I still don't think I've watched the final cut version that came out in 2019, right, right, um, which is like just 20 minutes difference, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, that scene was interesting, as was the French plantation scene kind of hit different uh in 2024 but the thing that really stood out to me and it's kind of uh, uh maybe on the nose because it's like with all the megalopolis uh hype you know one of the things that happened and was that oh. you know coppola almost got me too right yeah a little half me too action um yeah. but going back to dan's point about like everyone's capable of violence whether it's like getting amped watching people die on screen or actually committing murder yourself and i think that also fits into the scope of you know the objectification and taking advantage of women right yeah, of course. Uh, so i do think like while i totally see just like the general notion of like it kind of coming out of left field which is perhaps why it wasn't uh in the theatrical cut um where he's like what makes him like think that like this is something i want to do for like something i want to do for my guys but like on the other hand it's like this darkness within him being like i like i'm gonna let these guys like get their violence out on these women uh yeah. <laughs> and their urges right like the whole like thin line between sex and violence thing um to the point where like you know the tom hardy lookalike is you know putting the the playboy bunny in the same position as the centerfold that he carries with him on the boat right yeah Yeah. there that's like very much like subtle violence uh Mm -hmm. and it's it's done it's done for like both horror and comedy and yeah it's it's definitely uncomfortable in a lot of ways uh right okay yeah Yeah, let us get your reaction to that too yeah, yeah, no, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> something that might not uh, have too many different interpretations is uh, Michael Anderson's Logan Run from 1976. Did I, Did I choose this? I think you and you and I were going back and forth between doing this and Dirty Harry. Uh, okay, well, we've got a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty Harry. Okay, uh, but uh, let's let's uh, be fair. Uh, <laughs> well, this was this is like a classic seventies movie, regardless of what is we thought of it. Classic? That's what it's, I can. It's, it's I, talked a lot. Yeah, about, so? yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I yeah. I guess my my like early young childhood memory of this movie just got blacked out or something because I didn't remember this at all. Like every being talked about, but you guys, you guys heard about it being like younger. Yeah, I mean, it was always like I feel like in yeah. the in the discussion when it came to like big like the big turn of uh sci-fi in hollywood right um because it's like the year before star wars um it was nine you know nine million dollar budget which was insane for the time um how about you mike 
Yeah, no, it's always, it's not that it's talked about in terms of you have to see Logan's run. It's just yeah. when they <laughs> sci-fi from the 70s, it yeah. definitely was brought up. It was always, oh, Logan's run, Logan's run. And then it was just like, okay. And then I remember when I first saw this, I was like, this is what we're talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> I know. What the hell? Um, it, uh, it is It is something. I mean, it. it's not like it wasn't as bad as we did. What did we do? Barbarella? recently yeah yep. <laughs> i don't know man i i i didn't watch that. barbarella before this one <laughs> well I mean, there's other reasons for that um, <laughs> with this one wow i mean it's it's a you know what i i'll i'll say the opening uh carousel the open oh, that that's wild that's amazing i i like, was like it looks kind of dumb but like i was like this is kind of impressive for 76 like this yes. is yeah, a cool yes. idea yeah. And I, I, so I was, I was hoping that I, by that opening scene, um, that we were in for like a little bit of like Zardoz type, yeah. uh, camp. Right. Um, but yeah, it just never really, it just like toes the line too much. And then as soon as the dog shit robot shows up, I'm just like, this, <laughs> this, what the fuck? <laughs> um uh yeah did you it's okay this is a safe space mike we'll respect you if you think differently blah 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 uh, <laughs> what did you what was I'm, your... I'm gonna die on this logan's run hill i oh what's the first thing i'm like i i really i like miniatures so i was like oh cool look at yeah, all this yeah. this is great and then i'm like is this tomorrowland <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so and so i mean it's i don't know man it's just i i get like the like there's some forward thinking stuff in this film uh, sure. uh, you know what they're talking about like the future and just you know just what they're doing but they don't really go into a lot and it, it's kind of surface deep and then the movie drags and oh for some point towards, and i'm like wow like just get to the and like we're gonna go in there he's got this we're gonna we're gonna jump we're gonna get in here we're gonna go we're gonna stop it and his plan is to just yell at everybody <laughs> like that's the plan dude that's what you were I don't, what? so it just doesn't make sense. And every time I saw Richard Jordan, the guy, his friend that's chasing him, yeah. all I could think about was him in uh, Hunt for Red October. Tell oh, yes. him he's a politician, which means I'm a cheat and a liar. And when I'm not kissing babies, I'm stealing their lollipops. So I'm like, that's all I can think about. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Farrah Fawcett shows up for like five minutes. Right. And and turns yeah. out that like uh, Michael York, um, who I could, because we're 90s kids, I'm always going to just call Austin Powers his boss, yep. right? Yep. Um, but he apparently, like, he's the reason that both she's in this movie and she became, like, an icon pretty quickly thereafter. Uh, he, like, uh, discovered her, like, on a beach because she was, like, married to somebody that he was friends with and He's married to Lee majors. Wasn't she majors. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And Lee majors and Michael York are friends. And so like he asked her if she ever wanted or had any interest in doing film and he might be able to get her a bit part in Logan's run. So there, and that's how that whole uh, phenomenon so this is kind of like her break. Uh, right. It, yeah. It's that easy. <laughs> it's that, you just have to be freaking gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The most famous poster of all time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like from the manhunt stuff, I don't know. Is it even worth going into? I mean, I'm honestly. I mean, it's like. <laughs> I, will say, I, I, I will say that there is a similarity between this and Apocalypse Now. Oh, go for it. it. Yes. Get it. Because they both get put on a mission that they're not supposed to tell anybody about. Like it's yeah. a secret mission that they're both put on, you know, and it's always like, and if you know film noir, that's always not a good thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. So that's there was true. that connection. <laughs> I always find yeah. it too, like, uh, the thing that popped into my head, because I, I kind of did watch them nearly back to back. I was like, and this is going to sound off on a ledge per usual with me. Um but I found it interesting that like you have one movie, Apocalypse Now, which is sort of like, oh, like the savagery of like human beings in their natural space, mm -hmm. right? Like without any rules, like we're just like monsters, essentially, to some degree. I'm obviously simplifying that. But then you have this like Logan's Run and a lot of dystopian fiction is about the opposite. Alphaville we did earlier. Yeah. Have, like computers and rules and logic 
in societal norms, that's the evil thing. Right. Right. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's such a weird dichotomy. And this, this, I don't know, like this mindset that like, Oh, if you have a society that is structured and like you have these really strict rules, then it's going to be an absolute disgusting, awful nightmare, you know, 1984 type thing. I don't know. Like, it just seems so like, um, does that, I don't know. I'm throwing this out there. Does that play anymore? <laughs> like that notion of that? It just seems so like grade school to me. You know, like, <laughs> speaking like of school, school. <laughs> I, I was just talking about a uh, similar topic with my students um uh we just watched a minority report for a sci-fi unit and lovely yeah and it was super fun and the kids loved it Uh uh-huh and and the conversation uh veered after the film to the that question of like uh the whole like man versus man and then man versus technology and like ultimately is a man versus technology story just a different kind of it's just like a, a disguise for the man versus man uh, conflict. And here in Logan's Run, you kind of have that, because I, I, I couldn't help but be thinking about Minority Report while watching this, and you've got you know the classic, you know, it, you think it's technology, and that's where like they kind of just like fuck up their third act, right? Where mm-hmm. it's instead of in, in Minority Report, spoiler alert for a 22-year-old movie, uh, you know, it turns out that it is man versus man, right? It's not the technology. It's, yeah. it's that man is like abusing the technology, but here it's like, <laughs> like he like beats the AI, uh, with like a simple paradox, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's just like, there's no, that, that was kind of like my main th- through line or you take a look at my questions and notes. It's just like, this is just like glitz and glamour empty spectacle right this is this is more xanadu than star wars and And i love xanadu (laughs) yeah but but it's not enough like xanadu right um well it does pull it 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 pulls its punches constantly exactly exactly weird beginning you're like this is this is kind of fun uh but then yeah but by the time you get like half hour in and then but at the hour mark i am like i know they finally get outside and i'm looking at the Uh, runtime i'm like 45 more minutes how is this possible Uh, yeah and then you're and then you're rooting for them to just kill the old man because he just won't stop babbling (laughs) oh my gosh (laughs) reciting t.s Eliot. there's another connection you have uh yeah, you have uh, the 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 like reveal of um, the elder statesman at the end of both movies for different reasons, but they're both like babbling poetry nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so like, <laughs> if we had to find something to say about how Logan's Run fits into this manhunt genre. Um, obviously it's never going to, it's not going to be as deep and meaningful and profound as apocalypse now, but did you guys, cause one of the things that did stand out to me in my research is that the novel upon which it's based, um, basically stemmed from, uh, turbulent campus life in the 1960s, which oh. there's another apocalypse now connection, right? During Vietnam yeah. and how that like kind of counter revolutionary utopia, um, wound up like essentially you know just resulting in state violence right kent state etc um and so you know this movie would have been much more interesting if it had taken that light i mean there's been george miller nicholas winden reffin uh several others have like talked about remaking it because apparently the novel is a lot better um at least thematically uh in terms of like meaning and you know something more dense than what we were seeing uh on film in 76 do you think that like is there is there enough of a nugget here to like actually have something to say if it were remade by a more talented director i don't know mike what do you think yeah i mean i think remakes are for movies that just don't do it the first time right so yeah totally go for it i mean yeah i mean you, you gotta you, you gotta be able to do the robot better so <laughs> yeah. the robot what was its uh, mouth doing oh my god it was it was just the dude under there <laughs> just, a guy. just some like aluminum Fucking foil janky tin man shit yeah yeah i think that the the one thing that stood out to me though like thinking about i've never read the book but just kind of doing cursory research 
is they change the age. Oh yeah, yeah. They, like in the movie, it's thirty, which you know is not like super young, but it's not like old. In the book, it's twenty one because you it lived to your twenty one and you're dead, right? Because that's graduating college, right? Yeah. So and it's yeah. like I don't know. I, I just like books are always going to have obviously a lot more going on than you know, kind of a, a film like this. But yeah, I think there's definitely a huge potential there to like I don't know, just do. I mean, I guess we got the Hunger Games. It, right. It's kind of similar, yeah. right? Yeah, like, the Running Man. More importantly, oh, God, I hate that. Oh, that's right. Last episode. <laughs> I love that movie. Well, I guess I missed that in the '80s, and now I. That, that's I gonna be that's Edgar. That's Edgar Wright. Where you making that though? So exactly, yeah. yeah. That'll be yeah. fun as hell. Yeah, yeah. Right, it should so. be. It should be. But um, yeah, I think there's there's some meat on the bones, but they basically <laughs> just got nothing but the bones at the end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple other fun trivia uh, about the film. It was the debut of hologram technology. Uh, uh, which, didn't it win like an Oscar? Yeah, like a special effects uh, Oscar. And and to your point, Dan, earlier, like especially in the first half of the film, there's some re- really, you know, it's it, it's also the advent of the mall. And so they're like taking advantage of this huge real estate space that's indoors in texas to create these sets so in many ways it's you know got some impressive bits and pieces that maybe uh make some kind of argument for um it's time testedness but uh in terms of like an actual story and character and yeah theme it's there's it, it's it's unfortunate yeah. There's, um, well, there's so many questions that like uh, like you talk about like Paco's now is, it leaves you with some unanswered questions. There's like unanswered questions in this one where it's like I need them answered to understand right. what's going on here. <laughs> Very different kind of question. <laughs> um, Uber loved it though, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because of like, course he did. I, like the, the, what blows my mind about this movie is that like it does have such a great premise. And like all they had to do is like, okay, here's the setup, and then just tell an emotional story, and they couldn't do it. Like there's no, there's no honest emotional reaction in this film. Right. Like it, like it reminded me of like stuff from like the fifties where everything was like very like like a mid Atlantic accent and like everything was <laughs> yeah. like flat. Yeah. Like there's no emotion, actual emotion. In it. I was like, come on, guys, like. You're in the 70s. You can, like, open up a little bit. Right. Read, <laughs> there was an interview with Jenny Gutter, who plays the female lead, uh, and she – I had to read it, like, tw- two or three times to make sure I was reading it right. But she's like, yeah, and they had us try to do, like, a Midwestern East Coast accent. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you and Michael York are so very clearly British in this movie, <laughs> just like you are in real life. Like, I don't know. They should have – once again, Tom Hardy could have – done something interesting oh Oh, yeah (laughs) (laughs) Uh, are you guys ready for some trivia yeah let's do it yes okay uh so let me explain real quick uh i sent uh, mike and dan a graphic um 12 different movie posters uh manhunt movies from the 70s once again that uh theme is very open to interpretation i would love to argue about uh if any of them uh do not meet what you would consider to be the standards of a manhunt movie, either from the perspective of the hunter or the hunted. But nevertheless, 12 movies, I'm going to give you locations because if it's a manhunt, you got to go find where they are. And if by my clues of the locations where the film takes place, um, gravitates you towards one of those 12 options in front of you, shout out the name of the movie. First person to guess gets it correct, and there's five of them, so best out of five wins. Any questions? Let's do it. Uh, no, let's go. Okay, all right. Number one, we're going to start easy. A six-building complex in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. All the presidents, man. Let's Boom. go. Yeah, nice let's one. Let's go. Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I thought it technically counts, right? Like, they don't know who they're searching for, but they're they're trying to hunt down. Truth. They're hunting the truth. truth. Yes. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Truth hunt. Um, Thank you, Mike. Uh, Number two San Francisco skyscraper rooftop pool. And then to the San Francisco Police Department. 
Hmm? Is that Dirty Harry? No. Yeah, 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 yeah you got yeah, it, Mike. Yeah, you got it. Dirty Harry, damn it. <laughs> Throw a pen in anger. <laughs> See, there's violence <laughs> in all of us. <laughs> this is so much easier, Chris, when you had the list in the notes, and I feel like I could cheat. Right. Look I know. Uh, this is so much harder. Uh, okay, uh, number three, the American Literary Historical Society in New York City. But it's actually a clandestine CIA Oh, Three office. Days of the Condor. Yes, nice, nice. one, Mike. Yeah. I, I love that movie. Like two years ago. Yeah, yeah that movie's yeah, fantastic. I love it. Love that, it. that scene when they come in and kill everyone is great. Oh, my God, I know. Uh, dope. Okay, number four. I don't know. I, yeah, I think Dan will get it, maybe. And maybe Mike, so. Mike, Mike's been just killing it. You're, you're up 2-1. Okay, know. here we go. Number four. Dr. Mandrakis's home. A psychiatric facility. Tracy's apartment. When a stranger calls. Yes, Mike. Oh my gosh! You, you <laughs> I was might... gonna say that too. I just get too gun shy. I know. I know. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, because technically slashers, especially in the vein of like trying to hunt is, down a particular victim. Is that oh, like? Yeah. Is that? I've never seen that. Is that basically like oh, urban you... legend? Uh, really? No, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's the obvious, uh, like inspiration for the, basically every opening scene in a screen yeah. movie, right? The remix yeah. terrible. Oh yeah, do not watch that. <laughs> I think I've seen the remake. Oh, oh no, the see the original. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Okay, uh, number five. Uh, f- I mean, you've got it locked in, Mike. So let's just you know <laughs> take it clean, home. Clean the board. <laughs> Manhattan. Pressure now. Death Wish. Uh, Oh my god, this guy's nuts. <laughs> Mike, oh my gosh. Uh, I'm glad I got one in. You got one in, Dan. <laughs> but... Thanks, Foggy Bottom. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, that was a lot of fun, guys. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for, for coming on the show again. Uh, we can't wait to have you again soon. Um, what's coming up next uh, for, for Forgotten Cinema? Uh, so next week, like I said, we got the Forgotten Horror, so we're doing uh, Malignant, the twenty. Yes. Yeah, I know. I, I lo- that movie's got like ninety sensibilities all over it. Um, <laughs> it does. Yeah. Well, we're doing Dog Soldiers. That's an early two thousand class. Yeah, 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 March. Yeah. We're doing Night of the Comet from the eighties. Do you guys remember oh, that one? I don't know what that is. Ooh. That is so. That's where like the. A comet comes over Earth and the dust, everyone disappears. And those who do not get affected by the dust, they start becoming zombies. And it's just like, oh. it's these two valley girls that what? have to do like, yeah. It's the ins- it's basically where Joss Whedon got his inspiration for Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, uh, yeah. Cool. yeah. That yeah. sounds rad yeah. as hell. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, and then I think we're doing a couple others. But yeah, those are the three that pop out. So, you know, we're always Sweet. doing movies. <laughs> yep, nice. yep. You got to do the movies. Uh, of course. <laughs> uh uh dan what do we have going on next on film trace uh we got the 1960s coming up Boom. i think we're doing we're doing bullet and then what else are we doing bullet and the samurai the samurai yes which i've never just seen out on criterion yeah yeah so that's why i chose that one be a good one uh thanks for listening folks this has been film trace